Hello, everybody. Welcome to The Political Vigilante. My name is Graham Melwood. I have a very special guest here, uh, my first time uh, talking to Mr. Lee Camp. Lee, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to talk with us. Thank you. And I, I like to stress on very, you know, if I were just a very special guest, then yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, a very special guest. And uh, well, first I want I want to get into it. You know, I've been I've been you know watching your work, and uh, you know we're all sort of in the some of the same circles and stuff like that. The question I always like asking people that are in independent, progressive media is what what got you into this? When did things like when did you wake up, or when did things turn for you to realize that the that everything is not as it seems? When did your life spiral out of control and you ended up in? Uh, I I woke up well until so I, I I you know I I just wanted to be a comedy writer starting at about the age of twelve and then I wanted to perform uh, starting at seventeen and then I just wanted to be a standard stand up comic nothing nothing uh, that unusual about it um, but I started waking up more after college twenty one twenty two especially the invasion of Iraq it just seemed so ridiculous to me and and i couldn't understand you, you know why it was happening or anything and that's when i started to realize oh you know a lot of people have put out a lot of books on the manufacturing of consent and how our media goes about doing it and uh it it really kind of blew my mind and so it was around that time reading about chomsky and perkins uh, the confessions of an economic hitman and then i started getting my news from from places that were not your corporate media and, and that it just kind of, as you said, spiraled from there. So uh, I definitely didn't set out to be a, uh, some sort of dissident voiced comedian, but I, I guess here I am. No, it's so interesting that you say that because I, I must, I, I, when I got into comedy, I was 18 years old. I was a freshman in college at the University of Arizona and I wasn't like, yeah, I can't wait to be taking on the uh, kleptocracy run by the oligarchs like I didn't yeah. <laughs> was it when I started as an 18 year old and you know Jimmy Doors talked about this we sort of been forced into it like because no one else yeah. was calling it you know a good example and I, I'm sure Jimmy feels the same way was like with the election fraud stuff in the primaries in 2016 I ended up covering it almost every show and not because I was like oh this is what I'm about from here on out is is election fraud in the primaries, but I was just looking around at the other media and even a large degree, the independent media, and there's just nothing on it. And it, it was like, well, all right, if I'm going to be one of five people talking about it, then I guess I am covering it every show. And, and, and then you started to feel this responsibility of like, well, I, yeah, I'm a fucking comedian, but you know, if, if, if it's not going to be talked about by others, then I'll, I'll, I guess I'm doing it. I know, and that's the crazy thing is like, I mean, I've even had people, you know, call me out online saying comedy shouldn't be political. And I'm just like, oh yeah, you're right. Lenny Bruce, yeah, he wasn't about politics at all. You know, no. I Mort Saul, those guys were just about dick jokes. That's all that- Rich Garland, Bill Hicks, uh, even, yeah. even, Rich, even Richard Pryor. And, and, and honestly, like, it's interesting. I, I've found with black comedians that pe people don't call them political comedians because it's just like, for some reason, it's like because they're black, they're just talking about their experience when they're talking about the racism in our society or what have you. But it's like some of the most, I think some of the best political comedy when I was young was coming from Chris Rock and Bigger and Blacker. And, and uh, you know, he, he had stuff like that I consider pretty powerful. Like they ain't never going to cure AIDS. You know, they're just going to they're just going to keep they're just going to make it so you can live with it because the money's in the comeback. The money's not in the cure. And oh. It's like it's like that. That was the stuff that that's really powerful stuff. But yeah, no, the, the 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 comedians that are talking about real shit and usually from a uh, you know punching punching up rather than down uh, tend to be the ones that end up uh, remembered and end up leaving a legacy. You know, like Sam Kennison was a brilliant comedian, but because. I think he did a lot of, you know, anti-women and homophobic stuff. It's like you you can see kind of his legend seems to be going down and Bill Hicks is going up. Well, that's the thing. I remember watching Hicks. Uh, Jimmy and Dora and I were both, we met being young comics in Chicago. and We watched Bill Hicks at the Funny Firm in Chicago. And it was like we sat in the back of the room and our just our eyes were blown wide open. <laughs> and, uh, the thing, I, you know, so, so and, and, and here we are today. Why, 
I mean, I have a, I have a distinct opinion on this. I want to get your opinion on, and I've talked with Jimmy about this. How come there's like six of us comedians that are actually progressives? Because right now, all I see are at, at best, especially in LA, at best, comedians are neoliberals. At best, they have a Trump joke, and it's about his hair and his skin. Yeah, yeah. How, how come no one? I mean, I, I have a distinct opinion. I want to know what your opinion on why no one is talking about. Why comics are just, and then, and then there's this whole comedy of apathy. Like, I don't care. It's awesome. I don't participate. Yeah. Isn't it great? Here's my vape pen and my Tinder joke. Like, what the fuck? Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, I dealt with tons of that in New York City when I was there for for 12 years doing doing three sets a night. It was like, I would go on stage and do my thing. And, and you know, I, would, I, I got very good while I was in New York at, making the whole room laugh, even if I was talking about one, uh, you know, my political views. Mm -hmm. and, and so it wasn't like I was eating it. I've never had the Bill Hicks thing where when Bill Hicks started going down, he was like, oh, I'm, I'm going to fucking show you people. And he would bomb. He would just bomb horribly. But it was like a ballsy, like, I don't give a shit. We're still going through this stuff. And I never had that. I was, I, I if I started bombing horribly, I'd do some things to get them back. And then I'd yes. go back into it and it was always this kind of back and forth. But despite the fact that I'm doing fine up there, I'd have comedians go on after me or the MC or whatever and be like, what the fuck was that? He acts like he gives a shit. And just like making fun of me, but, you know, despite the fact that I, I did fine, it's not like eating it up there. But yeah, apathy in a comedy community is a big thing. And a, uh, I, I don't know, it's, it's trying to be uh, cool by being apathetic. But I don't really know why you don't see more. I mean, I'm sure some of it is that it is a tougher uh, lane to follow to try and make a whole room of people laugh if you're taking a political bent. So that's part of it. Um, and, and another part, although I don't know the comedians really think these things through this far, is that it's a lot harder to get on TV or to get these sets seen in Comedy Central and stuff. And when I first started, uh, you know, becoming more and more actively political on stage. I didn't think like, oh, this will get me banned from Comedy Central or whatever. I just did what, what I wanted to do. And kind of later I found out like, oh, you know, Comedy Central will have The Daily Show and the things like that, but they don't really want kind of no name comedy. Like that's, that doesn't really benefit them to just have someone trashing Viacom on their out, uh, airwaves or whatever. <laughs> so. Uh, I, to, to speak to your question, I, I guess it's also a poor, uh, poor career choice. I mean, I, I'm lucky that I've found my fan base and my outlet for it. But uh, in general, I think it is a tougher career choice. Well, I agree with that. And I think that's my that's the thing I've definitely seen, because if you, um, you know, if you're calling out the corporate media, I always say to people, I go, they don't just own CNN. They own Comedy Central, they own, I mean, HBO, they own any of the other outlets yeah. where you get stand-up comedy. You know, no no progressive comic is getting a new sitcom on NBC. It ain't happening. There's not going to be a like, hey, the, the duopolis bullshit sitcom, uh, Thursday nights <laughs> on ABC. You're not going to get it. Yeah. I mean, I was fired. Um, I got hired over a year ago to be, um, I, I've hosted game shows and I have a movie review podcast and this movie, okay. movie review company hired me to do a movie review game show. Yeah. And I was like, awesome. They're, and they didn't even, uh, I didn't even audition. They're like, Graham, you're the guy. And as we were getting ready to shoot the pilot and all of a sudden the producer a couple weeks into that calls me and says, hey man, they saw your Twitter feed and they I got to let you go. Now, bear oh, mind, sure. my Twitter feed at the, was not like all cap, fuck Trump. It was calling out corporate Democrats in the state of California. Anthony Rendon had just helped undermine single payer health care in the state of California. I got right. fired for that. And wow. I had to ask myself the question, and I had only been doing political vigilante about six months at that point, seven months. And I was like, do I want to keep doing this? Right. Because still political vigilante is still not exclusively paying my bills and I had to go, do I shut it down and just play ball with these guys? I've done over 300 episodes of regular TV. Well, that's what I was wondering is if rather than just firing you outright, if they'd come to you and said, hey, just 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 tame down the, you know, temper the, the Twitter a little bit because uh, we're not going to be able to keep you around if you keep saying these things. That, that, that does get done to, I think, some other comedians in various ways and I think it's probably a tough call for them. Absolutely. I mean, look, like there's so many things, there's so many shows John Oliver did that I liked. He called out the drone strikes during Obama. 
But then they pulled him aside and said, yeah, you need to slam uh, Jill Stein. And her donation money nosedived in the middle of that. Do you know they pulled him aside or does he just read too much of The Guardian or something? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, always wonder, I always wonder that because, yeah, he does some brilliant stuff. And then, uh, and then there's just like, you know, and the one, the one trashing Venezuela, trashing Jill Stein. And I was like, is this really the path you want to you go down now? It's just like I'm, I'm the new defender of our imperialist economic sanctions is is that really the best path here yeah you're right maybe they pull him aside or maybe he's just at these cocktail parties in manhattan with a bunch of neoliberals and he went oh yeah you're right that article in the guardian is true jill stein and susan yeah. sarandon did block hillary clinton's 1.5 billion dollar war chest no oh. yes yeah, sarandon has brought down all of the democrats it was her single-handedly she is the trojan horse i mean her and burn bros you know were arm in arm and prevented <laughs> hillary's motorcade from going to wisconsin we all know that's the truth oh, yeah. we prevented prevented hillary's motorcade from visiting any of the rust belts there was not a, <laughs> just, they couldn't get through any road to any average worker in america <laughs> yeah and every time they tried to pass legislation to help, work, help working class people, the violent burn bros made them go to globalization. <laughs> we all know this. Yeah. Um, but I want to talk about that next too. So what is it, What? how have you had to deal with the, you know, oh, you work for RT, you know, you're a Russian operative. I just told yeah. a friend of mine, I was on Aggressive Progressive with Ron Placone when Jimmy was out of town and we had Brigitte Santos on, which, and I was like, I'd never met her, and I, but I've seen her work and I love it. And I told a friend of mine, who I think is a very smart guy, he's college educated, and he goes, who's Brigitte Santos? I go, oh, she's got this cool show on, on RT. And he goes, God, aren't they a foreign agent? And I was like, come on, how do yeah. you deal with that? No, it's it's amazing to watch that we're in this new age of McCarthyism. And, and you know, I, I didn't live through McCarthyism, but we learned about it when I was growing up. And it, we, it was talked about like this barbaric time in America's past when everybody just accused everyone of being a Russian agent. And it was just such stupidity and we'll never go there again. And, and you know, we're past those dark ages. And here we are doing it all over again. This, and, and it's amazing to see, like, there's certain uh, progressives or, you know, or Mick resistance or whatever that, that are kind of left and they think, oh, this will be great. You know, we'll, we'll get all the, we'll accuse Trump of being Russian and we'll get all the Russians out and we'll, we'll accuse everyone of being Russian. And they kind of never realized, guess what? It's going to come back to hit you too because you're slightly left of the, of the you know, mainstream corporate center. And so it's like the, the same, you know, anybody who voted for Bernie now is a Russian agent. Anybody who voted for Jill Stein is a Russian agent. Anybody who, you know, think progress that was celebrating censorship is now being taken down off of Facebook because with a weekly standard is deciding what is allowed on Facebook. And it's like, yeah, you idiots, you can't celebrate censorship and not think it's going to come back. Anyway, I'm getting a little afield here, but uh, it, it is really sad to see. I, I just hope I just hope people judge my show redacted tonight by its own merits. Like I've never been told to say anything. I write unlike all the other uh, news comedy shows out there. I write every word I say on my own. I research on my own. And so it, it's just my it's the same thing I've been doing for 20 years in stand up comedy. I, I, I haven't changed any of it. And, you know, you can go back before I was at RT and watch me say the same shit. Uh, so, you know, I just hope people judge my stuff by that. And if that's not enough, I have a self-produced uh, comedy special coming out that uh, uh, Jimmy Dore opened for it in LA. And it's, uh, it has nothing to do with RT. It's my own thing that I created on my own. And it'll be up, uh, it comes out election day at uh, LeeCampComedySpecial.com. Nice. Everyone should go to LeeCampComedySpecial.com. Folks, I'll put that link in the show notes below so you have access to it and please check that out. Because I'm a terrible salesperson, I always forget this, but you get 25% off with the uh, promo code Uncle Sam, one word. So. Uncle Sam. Uh, well, because the title, the title of the special, it, very, it just rolls off the tongue. It's uh, super patriotic, very very Uncle Sam comedy special not allowed on American TV. <laughs> you are a marketing guy's dream, Lee. I mean, that's just, that's just, that's on a bumper sticker in a heartbeat, that one. It just rolls off the tongue. <laughs> well, I want to, so how is this, 
And, and I ask a lot of independent people, uh, in, in, especially in the last two years, because I, 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 I wrestle with this myself, like, how do you cover all of these stories without going nuts? Like, I have to, like, balance my life. I went surfing this morning. I have to. And when I'm yeah. searching these shows, I, I, I was watching Chris Hedges be interviewed by Jimmy Dore this morning over breakfast. And I was like, okay, I need to go in the ocean just bef and enjoy that before America eats itself. And then I'm going to come back and interview Lee and we're going to have a nice day. <laughs> I can kind of call him a friend now. My friend Chris uh, it is not good at making you uh, think things are going wonderful in the world. Uh, yeah. his, his, his books, I've never, you know, even before I knew him, I, I never got, felt like I got more, learned more out of a book and yet wanted to drive my car into a bridge embutment more oh. than when reading his books. <laughs> it's just like, just tying a hose to the tailpipe. This is a great book. Yeah. Man, I, I learned I learned so much right there. I just, <laughs> uh, but yeah, it, uh, yeah um, uh, well, I, I think that I one one way I get it out is through comedy. I mean, I, I don't know. I would have a tough time doing what like Chris Hedges does, which is you know sit there and just uh, uh, research how horrible everybody's lives are and write about in a very straightforward way so i feel like the the comedy is a a big uh outlet that allows me to keep going um mm -hmm. i think comedy can be used to actually not care if it's not used wisely it can be it can be like oh this is all a joke just ignore it whatever i'm making fun of is just a silly thing but i think if you do it a different way you can uh you can both get a release out of it and allow people to continue to pay attention to this the, the, these topics without uh, wanting to kill themselves and yet still feel the need to get active and the need to care uh, in, a, in a genuine way. So, I, I mean, I think that's the number one thing. But I also am a, a big fan of, let's see, uh, tennis and whiskey. So, <laughs> <laughs> not, not necessarily at the same time. But. Well, that should be the name of your next album is Tennis and Whiskey. Uh, yeah, yeah. And, I, 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 you bring up great points. It's one of the things, you know, that I've found in the last year or so, year and a half of what keeps me sane. So I, we just did a live Jimmy Dore show at Flappers in Burbank and, you know, Steph Zamorano was on the show and Mike McRae that does all his voices and Abby Martin. I got to meet her and, and Mike Preisner and I, I love the work they do on Empire Files. Abby was, uh, Abby was the other opener at the, uh, the comedy special. That's tremendous. And, and, and like the energy that she brings and that Mike brings, I mean... And those live shows, the first time I ever did a live Jimmy Dore show, the response and making people laugh, but making, as you say, making people laugh to think and to confront stuff versus just, I'm going to be the birthday clown and we can forget about our troubles. It's like we can laugh and give ourselves perspective. And then you're in a room full of progressives because I think as a progressive, you just feel like you feel isolated. You feel like a wing nut. You feel like some Area 51 ham radio operator, you know, that's just screaming into a camera. Um, and then when you do the live yeah. shows, there and like the progressive comedy tour that I've done with Ron Placone, the people that come out, and I'm sure you get this, like the live show is where you go right. I'm not crazy. And, you know, you were talking about other types of comedians, and uh, you know, you, you can get fans as as any type of comedian. Right. Uh, but I think that in, unless you're really one of these, you know, uh, crazy mega famous comedians, it's it's tough to get those fans that are like diehard. Except I feel like by talking about these important issues, we do get those type of fans where they're like, well, I'm not just laughing. I'm getting something more important than just laughter out of this. And so, the, yeah, the, the, the people that will come to these shows are just incredible people that, you know, I think, you know, could let a, a little over before the point of no return with climate change if we continue down this path. Uh, I think, you know, their, their heart is breaking for the world as, as is ours. And so... Um, it, it really is like the, the best type of people come out to these things. Yeah, it's amazing. And I've, I've seen, too, it also shows how much, you know, Ron Placone and I, we did a, our first progressive comedy tour was uh, in May. And we went to uh, Arizona and Vegas and San Diego. And we were in Arizona, right? Pretty red state, pretty, pretty Republican. And in the line of people in the meet and greet, was like this young kind of hippie couple with dreadlocks and you know 
tattoos and everything. They're like, oh man, we love you. We watch you on Jimmy Dore and watch Political Vigilante. You're awesome. And then right behind them was this like three older, like well put together, you know, probably have some money white ladies saying the same thing. Like, and that's the thing. I'm like, well, this doesn't fit the corporate media narrative that it's just a bunch of weed smoking, violent burn bros. Everyone right. realizes there's a problem and is starting to wake up to it. And that was so like, that's where I get hope. You know, I feel like, well, enough people are waking up and participating and, you know, so I feel like there's hope. So let me ask you this. How, what, do you, what do you think needs to happen? Short of like everything collapsing and we're all fighting each other over drinkable water and cans of food, what do you think we can do on the, on the progressive indie media or whatever the hell you want to call us to, to help fix it? I mean, aside from what we're already doing, obviously, but what on a, on a grander scale do you think needs to happen? I talk about this a bit in the, in the comedy special that I kind of conclude with this, that we, I think that we need to start working together in a, in a larger way. And I don't, I, I never considered myself an organizer. So I don't think, you know, uh, I'm, I'm the, the one that helped create it. Well, I can help create it. I don't know that I'm the one to create it, but uh, I think we need to look past our differences. And, and you know, I talk about it in the comedy special, I, I talk about how like, we're, you know, there's so much we agree on. There's so many, many of us that are opposed to the pro-corporate, pro-war, pro-Wall Street, right-wing shift of, the, of this country and the world uh, that, we, that if we were working together, we'd be unstoppable. But instead, we're just spending our time online like, yes, I know you're also against the police state, but you're not also a vegan. You're worse than Hitler. Like, that's most of what we do. And nothing serves the purpose of the corporate state more than for us to be splintered and separate and constantly at each other's throats. And so I try to avoid the absolutism. You know, I'll go on shows with people I, I disagree with and, and, you know, sometimes I'll get shit like, oh, you went on so-and-so show, but didn't you know he once said this? And it's like, well, A, no, I didn't know he said that, but because I try not to keep track. But B, it's like, yeah, people are going to say things you disagree with and you're going to be upset. But you, if we honestly just have this like absolutist, you know, it has to be perfect. Every, every dollar has to be perfect that, that came into their account, everywhere they've worked, everything. They, oh, they've never been on RT. They've done this and that. And then no one will ever be good enough. And I honestly think that the... The, the forces that want to stop us from joining force and join, you know, joining together and, and working to change things love to just separate things and keep that fighting going and that bickering going. And um, so if you look at the number of people that should be uniting to stop this, this uh, pro corporate, pro war, pro wall street, right wing shift, you know, it's, it's like 70, 80% of the country. It's like the black community, immigrants, women. Uh, if you believe in science, you should be joining in this like LGBT community. It's it, if you're into privacy or, or personal, uh, you know, choice, if you're like, it, we should all be working together to stop this thing. And instead we're in a thousand different directions. Yeah. I always say that the, 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 the 1%, the, the oligarchs that, you know, they want us divided red state, blue state, liberal, conservative, black, white, male, female. They want, they want us fighting over that. They want it because they don't want us to, if we all got together, like I point to stuff like this, when net neutrality was ended, the website that blew up the most, the, the message boards were NASCAR fans. Not probably a bunch of tree hugging hippies over there in the NASCAR side of town, yeah. but they were like, they were like, this is bullshit. And I'm like, we should be inclusive to them. We should let them like net neutrality affects everybody. Julian yeah. Assange put, be, being a political prisoner affects everybody. Alex Jones, I think he's nuts. I think he said, he said and done awful offensive things calling out shooter families as you know, like the, the, you know, the crisis actor crap. Just don't watch the guy. He shouldn't be banned. Turn him off. Block him. Yeah, no. He's, he's a disgusting human being, but it's like you had to be a moron to not realize that that would come back to hit us. Like, and sure enough, it did. Almost like clockwork. They were like, it, like it, it, people acted like it, it, it wasn't going to be used against anyone other than Alex Jones. They're sitting there dancing in the streets that he's been taken off all the platforms simultaneously. It's like, who do you think they're going after next? And there it was, what, a month later, two months later? 
anti-media, police to police, uh, cop block, anybody standing up against police brutality, like uh, uh, free thought project and and uh you know it's gonna be me and you next so how how do you how do people not understand that well they're already doing it to us i mean i i i'm i'm dependent upon youtube i've been demonetized my they've throttled my numbers i mean i just hit 10,000 subscribers i was stuck at 97 9800 subscribers for months because they were unsubscribing people the minute i yeah. post a video about yemen or saudi arabia man they, it's demonetized automatically they have throttled us. I've been, I've been, my big platform for a long time was Facebook and I've been stuck at 335,000 followers for the past two years. Like it literally, it has not gone over 335 in two years. And it also doesn't go below 335, which means I'm not like just tanking and losing all my subscribers. They're just made sure it doesn't get any higher. Uh, so it's, it's uh, very obvious. Yeah. And it's, it's pretty nuts. And so that's why I, I mean, for me at least, thank God there's there's platforms like Patreon. But Lee, um, I really appreciate you taking time to be on the show. Tell everybody again where they can find your new special that's coming out November 6th. Thanks, yeah. Uh, first stand-up comedy special in uh, in over four years. It's uh, It'll be out at LeeCampComedySpecial.com. You can pre-order now. And uh, to get 25% off, type in Uncle Sam, one word, uh, in the promo code. And 10% uh, is going to Veterans for Peace. Awesome. That's great. We went Veterans for Peace when Ron and I did the last progressive comedy tour. Guys, there's a bunch of progressive comedy tour shows out there. Go to GrahamElwood.com. Uh, November and January in Florida. November in Northern California. Check that out. Lee, thanks again, man. Really appreciate it. And hopefully we can meet somewhere on the road and do a show or something together. Thank you, Graham. Keep fighting. All right, dude. Thanks for watching.